Hi, everybody. This is Lauren Baker, founder of Search Engine Journal, and welcome to today's episode of the SEJ Show, brought to you by InMotion Hosting and SEMrush. With us this week, we have Brian Morrissey of Rebooting and formerly of Digiday. Hey, Brian, how's it going? Good, Lauren. I'm glad to be uh, glad to be here. Yeah, it's 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 really exciting. Like we've uh, we've kind of done like an unofficial theme of the SEJ Show over the past few weeks. Uh, last week we had Ann Hanley on talking about writing oh, content yeah. for audiences. A couple of weeks before that we had uh, we had uh, Neva on um, the CEO of Neva just talking about um, you know uh, subscription based models and yeah. getting into things like subscription based search versus the developing a product for the user and the user's experience versus developing a product for advertisers. Right. So mm. I thought that I thought that that was a a good unintended buildup yeah. to having no, yourself a on here today. There is a theme. It, 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 totally accidental, but I'm going to act like I planned all this out. <laughs> so there is a theme and, and, and it's really like one thing I wanted to do. And one thing that I've always tried to do at SEJ is to not just like um, to, to bring in folks that are outside of our little bubble of SEO, right? Because I think within SEO, we think of content as one thing. And then if you get into a meeting, and especially like an executive meeting or something, and you have people from all divisions of the company sitting around the table, content means something different to everybody else, right? Yeah. So I hear people talking about content in terms of what they're putting on Instagram. I hear about content in terms of what people are writing. I hear about content in terms of a song or a jingle. Um, so I really want to get into today a little bit about content from the publisher perspective, right? So that's why that's why you're here. And you're also you also been uh, consulting with us yeah, on our editorial side. So thank you so much. Yeah. Um, but before we get started, right, how about if, uh, how about if you introduce yourself and give our viewers and listeners a little bit of an idea about your background? Yeah, I've been a journalist in this industry for a long time, um, 20 plus years probably. Um, and I, I can remember, um, you know, I kind of fell into to covering online advertising. We called it online advertising at the time. Um, and because I knew I needed to specialize, right? And like, because like a lot of journalists are generalists and, and I was like, the world is moving more towards specialists and you're just more valuable in the market if you specialize. But I was trying to find what to specialize. And then like, I sort of fell into online advertising and I was like, okay, wait, this area is growing really fast. And like, I sort of understand what's going on because I was like covering some like general tech and I was like, oh my God, I'm, my, my head is swimming. So I, I specialized in it and I started covering um, the industry really as it was starting to take off in the early 2000s. And I have to thank you actually, Lauren, because oh. I, I, I got a job at DM News and I was covering like email and search. Mm -hmm. And of course, during the interview, I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, I know all about like search optimization, search marketing, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, oh, shit, I gotta fucking learn about this stuff. Um, and so I, I, I relied on, on, on SEJ for that. <laughs> I would just like, I would wow. read your posts and, and I would skulk around on different webmasters sites and stuff and, and try to piece together what was going, what was, uh, uh, going on. Um, and it was really instructive, honestly, to be, to be focused on that part of the industry, um, at the time, mm -hmm. cause it was right after the dot com era. And I feel like, you know, in the dot com era, a lot of people, when the crash happened, um, yeah. you know, they sort of wrote off what. Um, because there was a lot of craziness and that's why I don't like dismiss crypto. There's a lot of craziness in the dot com era, you know, it's pseudo and all these like pets.com and Cosmo mm -hmm. and urban fetch and stuff. But people were looking at the wrong numbers, right? They were looking at the NASDAQ number and they right. weren't looking at the percentage of, of households with broadband number. And that was the number that mattered. And so all the tourists went away, you know, Upside went away, red herring, maybe it limped on for a little longer. But, um, you know, the internet kept powering, um, particularly small businesses. And I really liked covering, you know, search in particular, but also email marketing and direct marketing overall, because like, you know, I like the direct marketers because it's like, you put it, if I put a dollar in and I get $3 out, I will absolutely do it. If I put a dollar in and I get 75 cents out, I will not do it ever. And mm -hmm. I think that was sort of needed. And like the industry was, um, you know, a lot of the brand dollars went away, but the performance people saw giant opportunities. Um, and search was like, you know, really people didn't understand how, how important search was. I, I can remember early in 
really my first job back in like 99 or 2000 meeting with find what remember find what Oh yeah, I remember fine. What they're so like go to, with, except yeah, for they're yeah. blue, right? Was like, uh, right. I remember a, meeting with fine one and go to, and they were explaining search advertising. These early search advertising, they were just like selling the keyword. There was no auction or anything like this. I was like, this makes a lot of sense. And they were mm -hmm. they were doing basically alchemy. They were turning the least valuable pages on the internet into the most valuable pages. That is like business That's alchemy, true. right? And um. Nobody truly understood how big search was because it was mostly, you know, small business and online businesses that were using. It was not like Ford and General Motors and Procter and Gamble that were pouring money into this. And Good so when Google it. filed its IPO, all these people all of a sudden woke up to how massive of an industry this was, um, it is, and and continues to be. So, I've I've been covering um, this space forever, forever, for since then. Um, but that's that's never really left me. And then I moved to Adweek and I became digital editor there. Um, mm -hmm. And then eventually I was thinking about doing my own thing, but I ended up meeting up with Nick Fries, who founded Digiday. And we, um, you know, teamed up um, at the time, you know, Digiday was mostly an events company. Um, right. And, uh, you know, the idea was to use the events as a, a platform. It, it gave us revenue um, to figure out the editorial and to build like a media company with a different model that was um, for us, it was our monetization was more around events. But what we mm -hmm. knew was that, you know, the quality of the content would, would was was you know, really important, if not the most important thing. Um, and that allowed us to then add content marketing and display ads and, and eventually subscriptions. And you know, it grew the business, became 75 people. Um, and then in October, I left. Um, 10 years of doing anything is a long time, I feel like. Um, and, and thinking about what I wanted to do next, um, I knew I wanted a little bit of a break from like running... Um, you know, groups and stuff. Cause like when you're just, not just managing, like all your time is spent like on that and not on mm -hmm. the product. Like I felt like a lot of my time was not even spent on the editorial product at some point. It was just like, you know, a lot of meetings, a lot of like, you know, really important stuff, but I wanted to get back to the sort of actually making the product and creating stuff. So I saw like the shift, you know, obviously with Substack, there's, there's a move from institutions to individuals and, so I thought it was a great opportunity to to build something new, um, and that's what I'm doing at the rebooting. Uh, it's a newsletter, it's a podcast, um, but it's going to be more. And how long has the rebooting been around now? Again, was it? Is it... It's been around like since I left, really. But it, like the first year, I sort of looked at it. I was like, I was also like, you know, it's coming up off of 10 years and I also had a non-compete and stuff, but mm -hmm. so it was more like a project um, and. And then I just like, I saw enough traction and I realized that this is what I want to do um, um, with the next 10 years, 15 years of my life. So I want to build the rebooting. And the idea behind it is that I think we're at a time of tremendous change um, of publishing. It reminds me of the mid to the, the mid, mid 2000s. What do you call the 2000s aughts? What are the aughts? The aughts are aughts? Pre the 2000s, the sands. 2005 so is, to 2010, whatever we sands. call those things. 05 to, there was a ton mm -hmm. of pu publications, and new brands that started there. I think we're seeing um, the beginning of uh, a mini boom in in new publishing brands. The the mechanisms that you use um, to make money and to build sustainable businesses are changing. There's more uh, emphasis yeah. on direct revenue, um, obviously with subscriptions, but also commerce. And I just think that there's a ton of um, stuff going on. So I just want to differentiate by focusing on, you know, the new, but also bringing the pers perspective of, of someone who has um, needed to do a lot of the stuff to build a sustainable media business. Because I was the president at Digiday, so <clears throat> I, I had memberships and, and all sorts of other groups and product and stuff that were part of my remit. At various times as well, because, um, you know, you brought up three different time periods that to me really define the internet, right? Yeah. One is the pre.com bust or whatever, or during, 
which is what 99 98 to 2000 2002 yeah. I, 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 I got there late though i got there at 2000 yeah. like in like and i started covering this stuff in june of 2000 and it, the nasdaq mm-hmm. had crashed in april i believe and so it, it it was the it was like going to a party where the bar had closed but everyone was so drunk that they didn't realize that the party ah. was over <laughs> It's like um, it's like when I walk into the bank right now. Everyone's trying to sell me like, "Hey, you want to refinance your house and everything like that." I'm like, "What? Uh, I remember this ten years yeah. ago. Come on, fifteen years ago. Are you trying to trick me again?" Exactly. Um, but so we had like uh, the early days of the internet and a bus. Did you know that the Pets.com sock puppet now is owned by a payday loan company? They utilize uh, yeah. it as their mascot. Yeah, it was bought. It was bought on, in, during b- bankruptcy or whatever. Uh, it was bought at auction. So there's a, there's a payday loan ah, okay. now. It has the same exact pu- puppet that they're still utilizing. It would be um, better if, I, you know, a crypto company should definitely buy that, like NFT well, it. Probably and like, will soon. They probably, yeah, I mean, it's very <laughs> similar vibes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> probably will soon. So then, so 2003 to me was the, the big changing point in publishing for me personally. And um, because... I remember I was trying, I was in internet marketing before and I was trying to build a site and it was just the worst. Like I was using front page, trying to FTP upload everything. (laughs) It it was just, it was horrible. And I can't imagine the amount of re. So you brought up a couple of things. One thing about the, the, the dot-com bust was that, um, and I I never thought of this was the percentage of broadband users, right? Yeah. I stole that from someone. When you brought that up, I'm like, I heard that AOL connect that meh, 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 like thing in my head, like when you're trying <laughs> to connect. And it used to take so long to like do anything, right? So yeah. that makes complete sense. And then 2003 was, I mean, to me, that's that's when Google bought Blogger, right? Yeah. So Google acquired Blogger and Blogspot, which is like all one thing. Um, Blogspot was a publishing component of Blogger, and Blogger was the back end. And that's when I started SEJ because of I had wanted to do something previously, but it was just too much of an obstacle to launch a site at the time, resource, too many resources. And I'm like, what? I can do this for free? So like I set everything up on, on Blogger slash Blogspot. I bought the domain for 12 bucks, but uh, that wasn't free. And then it was just like time. It was just me and my time and my focus, right? Yeah. Those were my out-of-pocket expenses with starting it. And I had a lot of time because I was living abroad in Brazil at the time, kind of halfway jobless. <laughs> but uh, it's a longer story. But um, so I was just building that and along with a lot of other sites and it just kind of took off. And then now we're having this renaissance, <laughs> yeah. which it feels like it's kind of, is this, is this also like part of the pandemic as well? Do you think the pandemic yeah. kind of, in the same way that it, that it, that it fast tracked uh, e-commerce and buying direct versus going to the store or even curbside? You think it's also fast tracked personal publishing or personal business oriented publishing? Like you're doing yeah. the Substack and the rebooting? I mean, I think the, you know, I always say like cliches like have some basis in reality. And like, you know, the cliche mm-hmm. that the the pandemic accelerated all sorts of existing trends um, is completely true. Right. And right. it's not like e commerce adoption was not continuing, it just accelerated it. It's, it's not like, um, the the nature of work was not changing it accelerated it um the lack of trust in institutions has been going on for a long time i think the pandemic accelerated that and i think that is behind the opening of a lot of individual publishing brands because people tr- trust individuals more than they trust um uh institutions that's true. Uh, it's a trend you're seeing that in media right now too, right? Like, yeah, yeah. That's what I mean. Like in, yeah. in media, and but I think you know, and media itself always goes through these periods of unbundling and then rebundling. And so, mm-hmm. the pandemic like accelerated an unbundling of media that's been going on a while. And now I think we're going to see, hopefully, some smart rebundling. We're already seeing different like you know collectives going on because you can't have, you know the. The subscri- there's too many friggin' subscriptions out there. Let's be honest. Like, <laughs> it's going to I mean, catch up after a while. <laughs> well, but it's a better model. If you think about Substack as, as the new um, blogger and stuff like this, Substack is uh, um, a media business in a box. What, what blogger was, was, was a CMS in a box, right? right. Like you could get your shit out there, um, but how are you going to make money off it? Um, yeah, AdSense came along. When did AdSense come along? You, you know 
you have a better. I can uh, only I like say 2004, 2000. 2004, okay, around there, a little yeah, bit. Like, right after you know. they bought Blogger, yeah, because they were testing it within the Blogspot <laughs> um, navigation um, and not giving us any money. And then they lost yeah, yeah. sense. You're like, oh, you all get a little bit. And if you think about like what you know, um, I'm going to mention Web three, but like the whole like point of the Web three stuff is like it's sort oh, of yeah. a do over. It's going back and trying to to there, there's always been this gap between the promise and the reality when it comes to internet publishing and just the internet mm -hmm. in general, it was going to like get, we were going to do away with gatekeepers. You could be in Brazil dream. and you could just set up a site and you could reach and thousands and thousands of people and all this stuff like this. Let's face it. That dream became like in many ways, a nightmare. You know, we have more information, but we have more disinformation. People don't seem, mm -hmm. People are grumpier than ever. <laughs> like it's like you open Twitter oh, and it's like open combat. Uh, <laughs> I'm like arguments left and right over nothing. Like I saw people arguing about Wordle yesterday. Like Wordle. Like Wordle. Apparently, it's just like new. Are you oh, I know Wordle. Like, yeah, yeah. I haven't done it at all. I have no idea what it is, but it's just like. like so Wordle is a great a example. Actually, it opens up everyone can play, and then you share your score. Lauren, this tells back, me. This tells me, okay, however, that, no you, that you that you did not read my my newsletter this week because no, I like I zero in on Wordle. <laughs> I did. I'm gonna read because it this, this is the reason I think Wordle is like interesting is like just a little bit of a tangent, but somewhat related is that it's bringing scarcity back. So one of the things that like mm -hmm. the internet was tremendous at was that it obliterated scarcity. Right, anyone could publish, everyone can publish. The pro nobody thought about the downsides of that. Right. And like, I honestly think, particularly for people like you and I who like grew up like kind of analog, right? Like, mm -hmm. I didn't have email yeah. in college even. Um, the internet's kind of broken our brains, right? Like, I mean, we weren't meant to like have this much information and try to make sense of it. And I think that there's this move to go back to scarcity. And I think part of the newsletter, um, the attraction of newsletters is that they're typically scarce you know most come once a week at most some people do daily and stuff like this i think it's too much but like there's scarcity it's finishable like you know a magazine you finished it okay fine the new york right. you, you might not read every poem but like you know you can finish the stuff whereas the internet is infinite it's like literally like you know there's no the beginning there's no end the infinite page mm -hmm. which technically is does not exist because i remember with our product people like we were doing the infinite scroll it's like infinite scroll doesn't actually like you do have to end at some point <laughs> at some unfortunately <laughs> but nobody knows um, it's 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 basically infinite so anyway that was one over all of these transitions no problem i and i'm gonna i'm gonna read your newsletter right after this uh, because I'm not <laughs> oh, i had to call argument. you out i had to call you out lauren i'm not gonna get an argument about wordle until i'm educated on it um but uh so now we're at this period where personal publishing has become a thing easier than ever. The Substack is subscription-based model. I, I'm a little yeah. bit okay. Good. It, it, it's so, subscription-based. I don't. I don't run. I don't do subs. But just. Um, but you have I, the option to. Yeah, yeah, I run ads. I like mm -hmm. ads because I like open access. Like I, I want like people to have free access to it. And I just know that like even if I wanted to do subs um, later on, like it's better to have a top of the funnel. So. Yeah, I'm a fan too. I'm not a fan of the paywall at all or the subscription wall or anything like that. I did I did subscribe to um the is it the athletic, the athletic the other day because I really wanted to watch, read an article about the Baltimore Ravens. And it's just like one of those things where I keep on seeing the ads on my Facebook. And I'm like, ah, I'll pay three dollars, four dollars a month for yeah, this. Yeah, deal, but you gotta cancel it then. Yeah, better. Let me, let me put that on my calendar. But um right I now promise, I promise you the athletic's not gonna send you a reminder. <laughs> No, I don't want to hurt their ARR, the MR numbers. <laughs> They're like, let's keep um, quiet. It'd be a good yeah. time to keep quiet. Yeah. So uh, let's see here. So, <clears throat> which is which I've always found funny is like publishers. I'm like, you're emailing me like nine thousand times a day. Yet when my three dollar like intro offer is about to get jacked up by four hundred percent, then all of a sudden you're very quiet and you're <laughs> incredibly, incredibly, incredibly. So um, personal publishing. And not only personal publishing, but business publishing. So in my early days of SEO, um, yeah. I remember I was working with a, I was working with a plastics manufacturing, fa plastics fabrication. They made like molds, right? And okay. I, we were talking to them and we're like, 
they're like, you know, we really want to build ourselves up, but no one cares about what we do. Right. And, and I was talking to them about it and it's like, you're in plastics fabrication. Like you don't need a thousand people going to your site or a thousand people reading your blog or your article on a, on a daily basis. You need a handful of the right people. Right. And you can be, if you start investing in publishing and writing today about your industry and your space, you can be the leader of your industry within a matter of years, right? Even sooner. Um, and that was the thing that kind of got me about SCG when I first started. I remember I read a, it was a thread on, um, gosh, uh, I can't remember the name of the forum. Oh, Site Point Forums. And mm -hmm. someone just basically wrote, if you're investing in yourself and you at least publish once a day, in 10 years, you can be the, the world book encyclopedia of your space, right? And I really like that. It made sense. I don't have to do it all at once. I just have to make that commitment and that investment. So we're at this time right now when, when, when you can individually start that. Anyone can go and individually start a piece, right? And it, if you're a content uh, expert or a domain, if you're an expert on, um, on publishing and running a publication like you are, uh, everything to do with editorial and advertising, that's fine. If you're an expert on SEO, so we have like Ayeda Solis and Kevin Indig and a lot of other people in the search space, they've gone and, and they've launched their own personal newsletters and their own yeah. sub stacks and everything else, and they're doing quite well. How can, first of all, should, should companies like, does it make sense to focus on a niche, a specific content niche in this space? or to broadly go after everything. So is it, uh, is it buckshot or birdshot when you're targeting your audience, who you want reading and putting together your, your editorial strategy? What are your thoughts on that side of, of the okay. house? I'm not going to use buckshot versus birdshot because even though I live in the South now, like I was living <laughs> in New York for 20 years, so I have no idea the difference between the two. You grew up in Pennsylvania. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's true. But I lived like in Philadelphia, like you okay. know, not not in the more Alabama um, mm. parts of, of the state. Well, buckshot um, is when there's one little hole in the stop sign and birdshot is when the stop sign is full of uh, BB dents. Because uh, when people drive by and they shoot stop signs on the way home from hunting, when they don't catch it, they don't shoot any, they don't shoot okay. any animals. That's the thing. OK. So anyway. OK, so but in general, to answer the question, like. I, I think that we're seeing a few like sort of shifts right now, as I said, like institutions to individuals. I think people trust individuals more than institutions. I think right. we're also seeing um, a shift again. It's been going on for a while, but from like general ism general stuff like if you look at mm -hmm. like the the publications that defined the last era they they took mostly a generalist approach because they were looking to amass large audiences. Right. Um, to more specialized. Like I think like whether you pronounce it niche or niche, usually when I'm in Europe, I say niche in America because I, I try to style myself as a man of the people. I say niche. Okay. Um, and, you know, but you could also rhyme it more. You can say riches and niches, niches get stitches yeah. and stuff like that. Uh, um, and I think there, the other one is, I think we're seeing a shift to expert. Right. And I think expert is incredibly right. important and it opens up publishing. I think a lot of journalists in some ways struggle with this because journalism by its very nature is generalist field. You're trained to be able to cover fires, to be able to cover courts, to be able to cover a sports game, et cetera, et cetera. And one of the true you know, defining skills of journalists has been being able to parachute into like some literal geography or area and like make sense of it very quickly and stuff like this. I don't think that cuts um, the mustard, I guess, or I don't know. I don't think it, it cuts it as much as um, it did in the past. I think that mm -hmm. the, in, in era in which information is, is, is everywhere um, its value ends up going down, but I think separating the signal from the noise is um, an absolutely critical function right now because it actually goes up like as more information um as more information gets published right the absolute the the, the value of each piece of information goes down right but mm -hmm. as more information and more noise goes the signal the value of the signal actually goes up so you're much more likely to be able to 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 separate the signal from the noise if you have expertise in an area 
Um, so that's what I was saying with the rebooting, like I was thinking about what differentiated me. I'm interested in lots of different areas, like, you know, decarbonization of economy and all sorts of things. I don't have the network, but I also don't have the expertise. I've been doing publishing for, for 20 years or so. I want to like figure out a model and I'm going to figure out a model in which, um, there can be more expertise. And so I think that opens up a, a, a big opportunity for companies and and for individuals to um, to use their to to basically publish their expertise, and they can use it right. to find clients. They can use it like for also like your pipe fitter. Like they might say like, well, who cares? It's like there are there are hundreds of people out there who who are in the pipe business who really want to hear this 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 company's expertise. They do because they have more expertise than like say me. Maybe not mm-hmm. you. You worked with them. You know a lot about the pipe. I know how to rank it. That's it. <laughs> but yeah, I think like that's like a really exciting um, change. One of the things that I love most about what's happening in publishing now is that more people are publishing expert level content. It's it's amazing like that you can get you know the equivalent of like you know a uh, master's degree or PhD level, like in all of these areas. And, and still many, many of it is for free because people are publishing their expertise because their model is not ads and it's not subscriptions. Their model is business, right? Um, and so I think publishing itself is changing. It's not about ads. It's not about subscriptions. You know, there's a lot of different ways you can make money if you have a tightly defined audience Um and particularly if it's a community um, mm-hmm. that needs your expertise. Yeah, I, I agree. And that's that's one thing I really see about the value of email at the end of the day is, especially from a newsletter perspective, is it is more intimate, right? You feel like you're getting yeah. something delivered to you, which you are. Um, and then everyone's inbox is as intimate as your mailbox, right? Like people really cherish their inboxes. Biggest complaint I ever hear about LinkedIn. Oh, the inbox is full of crap. The inbox is full of crap. No, no, one, no one's like, hey, I don't like this on LinkedIn. I don't like that on LinkedIn. They're like, oh, I get pitched spam every day. So uh, inboxes, uh, people have a very uh, personal relationship with their inbox. And but the you ability know what? to let you in is, is yeah. pretty huge, right? So I think like that's like, um, it's like everything in, in, maybe it's everything in life, but definitely like in the internet, it's like every everything that like all of its greatest strengths are its greatest weaknesses, right? Mm-hmm. Like email works too well. It works too well. It's too a many dream. companies are dependent upon email. Because, like, I always joke, like, it, when you look at the data, you're always told to send. You're always told to send because mm-hmm. even if you lose like forty five, whatever, like you know, unsubscribes. If you send email, things happen. If you're selling a product, you send an oh, yeah. email, you sell stuff, mm-hmm. and it's. The cost of sending is pretty much zero. I remember, do you remember like the, the, the like stamp? There are these like startups that wanted to, back when spam became out of control before the Can't Spam Act, there was, there was startups that wanted to like basically develop franking for like commercial email. Like everyone yeah, agreed yeah, it was yeah. broken, mm-hmm. but like it was like, how do we, because you have to, you have to add economic costs, right? To, right, to send right. it. Um, you know, unfortunately, we got like, you know, just outsourced it to the platforms to um, to handle. Uh, but yeah, like I think email is like incredibly powerful and it's very personal. Um, I think what I worry about um, is the history of the Internet is like one tragedy of the commons after another. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, it's funny how it always goes back to email at the end of the day, right? Like that's the one thing you can pick up and carry with you. It's, it's the one thing you 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 own and you don't rent. Right. You rent Facebook, yeah. you rent, you rent uh, LinkedIn, you rented MySpace or Friendster previously, you rent uh, everything else, but uh, email and your own site are the only things that yeah. you own. And, and it, look, rent. it's, it's, it's not perfect. Right. I mean, there's still right. like, I mean, you get shoved into the promotions tab by Gmail. Um, you know, Apple is um, everyone's, everyone's open rates um, uh, ha- have gone up thanks to Apple because uh, in the name of privacy, they're they're screwing with the the pixels that tell you whether an email <laughs> is opened or not. So yes, um, any, everyone uh, out there yes. is sending email. You didn't suddenly become more popular. I was like, oh my god, people are really into me more so than a few months ago. 
Thank you for bringing that up, by the way, because on last week's episode, we were talking Nobody about- wants to talk about it who sends email because they're no. like, don't tell, don't tell, don't, don't tell. Don't tell anybody, yeah. <laughs> but last week, I was talking to Anne about the sunsetting of um, third-party cookie tracking or third-party uh, cookie yeah. serving within uh, Google Chrome browser. No one talk. Everyone talks about that. Hasn't happened yet. What they they sunsetted flock and they're putting out something new. I can't remember the name. I should know. Fledge. This. I'll look in a second. Um, it's something like uh, Google Moments or Topics or something. I'll, I'll oh, topics. Out. Anyway, yeah, yeah, they're doing topics. Yeah. yeah, but anyway, like everyone's talking about Google Chrome. No one's talking about when Apple Safari did this like a year and a half ago on the most popular mobile browser in the U.S. Right. So Google Chrome is, is, has been talking about possibly doing it. We're, we're building out our plan. We keep delaying it. It's the news of the land. Apple and Safari, again, the most popular mobile web browser there is, did it a year and a half ago. Totally screwed up everyone's Google Analytics. So yeah. everything that used to go in organic is from there, especially with branded queries, is now indirect in Google Analytics because Google Analytics can't pick up the, like Apple bypassed Google, right? So when you type something into your Apple browser now, uh, first of all, you can't be served the cookie to track it via Google Analytics. And secondly, like so, Siri suggests is like, hey, did you mean this site? Let's go here. Bypass Google directly, boom. So um, that might happen on the Chrome side sometime soon. Anyway, uh, I don't want to get too off tangent here. <laughs> so niche, niche or niche Which content. Which are we doing? We're, you know and broad content. So there yeah. was a big move with broad content. I feel like that move, like we were talking about Huffington Post a little bit before the show. Yeah. I feel that move was really to appease investors. Yes. And when I think that's companies safe to like say. AOL. Yeah. So like, like, and I, I didn't even think about, I totally forget about this. Like uh, when AOL purchased Weblogs Inc. And I guess Aqua hired Jason Calacanis at the time. Um, that, that, that's that's really some money that, off that. I think they bought did, him for like did. thirty yeah, mil yeah, or so. Yeah. So um so, so Jason, by the way, Jason was my first boss. That's why I say like he, oh, really? I, my first Were job you... was at Silicon Alley uh reporter. Oh nice, nice. So that kind of legitimized the whole like niche topic in blogging thing, right? Everyone's like that was like that's like Bitcoin going oh from a thousand bucks to sixty thousand bucks. Everyone's Shit, like, "Shit, you're giving I Jason gotta this much do credit this right I now. Know, I gotta sore. do this right now, so I can do this as well." So um, you don't want to anyway. inflate Jason's ego anymore. No, nah, nah. <laughs> but um, so Huffington Post did that, and then AOL, like all AOL properties, ended up doing that, right? So Huffington Post, we were talking about this earlier, started out as Ariana Huffington's own personal site where she was giving a voice to her friends that were celebrities, actors, whatever, on the political side of things. The word Huffington Post obviously is a joke, a play off of Washington Post. Um, and then, um, ironically enough, uh, rest in Virginia-based AOL started just buying up everything, including TechCrunch and multiple other properties. Uh, and Gadget, I believe, was part of the, one of those acquisitions at a time, too. And then suddenly, suddenly TechCrunch was writing about everything. Huffington Post, anybody can go to Huffington Post, could go to Huffington Post, set up an account, and start writing about things. So we even saw this in Forbes. Like Forbes went from being a business and entrepreneurial okay. magazine to being just about like anything because they started opening yeah. up. They opened up the floodgates, right? So this goes back to like drinking everything from the fire hose from a broad yeah. informational perspective to like pinpoint targeted content. What changed? Like what led to that boomerang effect yeah. with all of these niche publications opening themselves up and then now kind of pulling back a little bit and going back to their roots? Like, like what do you think was the, the, the major change there? Business models. Okay. I, I mean, the way that, you know, look, the, the big bet, um, of a lot of venture capitalists that backed um, internet publishing business because publishing is not like a VC type. It's not like software. It's, it's not, not SaaS. Yeah. It, it just is, it takes longer. The margins profile is different. It's just, but you know, everyone looked at that Mary Meeker slide that was being used at every um, every conference. Like I, I think the successor to the Mary Meeker slide was the the Terry Kawaja's like Lumascape. But like or, the original one was Mary Meeker had a slide and then had two lines that had time spent and budget spent for different media and mm -hmm. internet 
uh, had this like, you know, giant line going up of time spent. And then the budget spent um, was far lower. And there was a big delta between the two of them. And, you know, it was however many billion dollars. And the, the idea was eventually those lines would, would compress. And they did. Mm. It was a good bet. Here's the thing, though. All that money went to Google and Facebook because ultimately right. there was no scarcity on the internet. And so the mm. only way you could, you know, CPMs only go in one direction down. And so the internet basically commoditized all of publishing. And so the only way that these publishers could keep up with declining ad rates was to continually to produce more. I mean, you remember like, I mean, that's why, mm. that's why, that's why the world was bequeathed the slideshow. That's why the world got <laughs> pagination. I mean, people were clamoring in the streets. These articles are too long on a single page. You need to paginate, break it I into need, four yeah. pages. I need to click. I need to get more pop-ups and pop-unders. Is that an arrow or is it an ad? I can't tell. Let me click. Doesn't it. Oh, matter. Let's ad. click. You know, matter, I actually, yeah. it was a little tough. I, I, um, I don't, use piracy sites normally, but if I'm not given mm -hmm. an easy path, um, I do use, basically my wife was, was why we have one TV in here, but she was watching sex in the city, but I needed to watch the Sixers game and it was on TNT and I already pay NBA, whatever. I had to go on a piracy site. I clicked on at least oh. like nine ads trying to get this game to play. So like, Anyone yeah, for from, like 15 minutes, they pop up again. Anyone right? from Bovada who is looking at their, uh, <laughs> their report this morning, that's me. That's me. And I don't bet. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's but that's what happened. Occasional football Sunday. Yeah. That, mm. that, but that's, that's what happened. Weirdly sports gambling is not legal in Florida where I, as far as I know, everything is legal. Um, the, but that's what happened with these sites. I mean, remember like Mashable was covering like the first Ukraine invasion. Like, and it's like, what? Yes. Aren't, aren't you like, the, what happened here? What happened? Aren't you the site that was telling me like 15 things every social media manager needs yeah. to know about Yelp and stuff? Um, nobody stayed in their lanes. And I, I you know, I, I think that, you know, going narrow and deep is like, is really powerful. But I think business models led people to chase after these giant audiences. And, you know, if it, if, Ultimately, Huffington Post mastered SEO and stuff like this, but then it became the search. And so everyone was writing for, not for audiences, but for algorithms. And I think mm -hmm. like, you know, I know we're probably going to be running up on time, but like, I think an important point um, is that your original point about writing for Anne Henley, like it's actually like an important point am amazingly that you have to make is like writing for audiences, yeah, writing for people for audiences, not for algorithms. The days of writing for algorithms it, it, it are, I wouldn't say that they're over. Algorithms rule the world and stuff like this, but they've become mature. And that means there are fewer opportunities to game the system. And that mm -hmm. for me, I know I've always thought, I'm not smart enough about all this, the viral stuff or the SEO stuff to like really know how to game the system and that I would rather use that time an effort that it would take for me to learn how to possibly game the system to just make better stuff for right people, for people, <laughs> right? Right. For people format for algorithms. And that's I think I that's, yeah. Okay. I like that. that Cause that's like if packaging is packaging. Right. And like, right. I got nothing against that, but let's face it. I mean, you're like, you're an SEO pro. Like, you know, when you've arrived at a site that like has just SEO itself to like, mm -hmm. you know, I'm like, okay. Could you please stop repeating this word? Like, please, like, yeah, it's well, like re you know, recipe sites. It's like, when did they become the worst s sites on the internet? Uh, I, I first had this banana pudding while I was trekking through the forests of Peru. And give me, yeah. give me the recipe. <laughs> yes, exactly. I always so, say like the biggest indictment of the current state of the internet is the jump to recipe button. Oh gosh! I, <laughs> if I had an app that would just do that, it should browser, not exist. Jump to yeah. recipe button shouldn't have mm -hmm. to exist, or just block everything. Just block everything except for, <laughs> give me an ad blocker that blocks everything except for. Oh, like give a notification by the recipe blo blocker. I don't understand why. And this is again, it goes back to like the optimization of the internet. Like every single form of optimization that the internet has come up with has ended up being done to death. Like it has like because the internet is so open and so vast and broad that no matter what the, 
the, the, the tactic is it will end up being used for nefarious purposes to some degree. Well, here are, okay. So let's, let's look at another, cause I didn't get this until we, when we were talking earlier, but I got it now. So yeah. Broad content and niche content. Another really good example of a company that first did this broad, I mean, kind of broadly, but they divided it out within the site itself was about.com, yeah. right? So about.com was writing about everything, about guides here and there. And I was at a conference. I was at a conference in in, in uh, St. Pete, not too far from you, St. Pete, Florida, um, yeah. just across Alligator Alley. And the uh, the founder and CEO of Penny Hoarder at the time, he was speaking just about launching a uh, niche personal finance site, how he was writing for younger generation, you know, millennials, annuals, et cetera, not writing like uh, their parents' site would be, personal stories, everything else. And someone asked him, who's his biggest competition? And he said, he said, well, you know, I've noticed all of these sites called like the business this, the business that, and this company called Dot Dash has come out of nowhere and now they're competing with us for everything. And I'm just like, I'm sitting there in the crowd. I'm like, I can't believe that no one realizes that these, that dot dash used to be about.com, right? All they did was they took everything off the about.com subdomains and they turned them into their own entity sites and then built out more entity sites on top of that. I mean, that's not yeah. all they did, but that's basically what it was. It was just chopping up. It was, it's like about.com was just, huge redwood that everyone was always looking at and it finally fell down and then everyone went and they chopped up their piece of it and and planted up and then they grew multiple redwoods around this like point being is that all of these all of these sub brands or yeah. all these new brands just basically used to be subdomains of a site that was trying to be everything to everyone exactly i guess it didn't work i think it's like propagation right it's like plants like propagating a plant um, is that how that worked? Is that what it's called? Which is like, a, to me, it's like a form of sorcery. I don't trust that. I don't mm -hmm. like that going on in my house. I'm like, the idea that you're going to take a piece of a plant and then develop an entire other plant that seems like a form of sorcery. But yeah, <laughs> I think that's a great um, point because look, about.com was left for dead and gone. Like, you know, it was yeah. bought by the New York Times. Everyone like, everyone slobbers over the New York Times nowadays, but like they owned like the company that just bought Meredith. And they screwed it up royally um, mm -hmm. and for a whole bunch of different reasons. But, you know, I give like Neil Vogel um, all the credit in the world. I remember meeting up with Neil when he just um, joined uh, uh, IAC to, to run what was then still about.com. And, you know, he, he made tough decisions. And I think one of the ones was not just like breaking them into very well and all the different brands, but, you know, they trashed a good portion of their content that, that mm. was not up to par. And that's really difficult to do, you know, like, um, Nobody wants to take big numbers and make them smaller. Not on the internet. No way. Right. Um, and it's a hard sell. If you're going to trash uh, a bunch of, I forget what percentage, um, but if you're going to like do that, you're taking a hit. And you know they really doubled down on quality. I feel like, and it, the bet really paid off. I'm really glad it paid off. You know they they did like heretical things on the internet like take ads off a page mm -hmm. holy shit that's that's <laughs> the same but you know like for me on the seo side typically when i'm going into consults especially with a bigger site bigger company first thing i tell them is you got too many damn pages indexed by google too many of these pages that don't mean anything indexed by google you they're like, we have millions of pages indexed. Yeah, well, We're not getting any traffic, but we have millions of pages. Like, no, no, that's not that's not a successful KPI. <laughs> they have millions of. Pages but again, indexed. it's like it's like email lists. Like the the, right. the best thing to do with email lists is to periodically prune it and to get mm -hmm. rid of like all the dead addresses, the unresponsive and stuff like this. But here's jobs. the thing. Everybody wants to talk about the big numbers. They don't care yeah. that. Um, and it was, it's always like a struggle because nobody wants to um, have smaller numbers. And I think one of the mm -hmm. things that's going on now is 
I do think media is going to be is can be a very good business, um, and I think that a lot of publishers are going to be smaller and more efficient. And I think there's a whole different bunch of different ways to do that. But the requirement, particularly on the ad side or the investing side, is like the numbers are going to get smaller. If you mm -hmm. want real, they're going to be smaller. Okay. If you want bigger, oh, we can make that. Like, yeah, we'll go back the, and we'll make bigger numbers. The audience numbers might be smaller. But it's yeah. a quality over quantity component, yeah. right? Which is going to, it's going, I mean, it should, in theory, the, uh, thank you, Suzanne, for that, quality or quantity. So if we're focusing on quality, smaller numbers of an audience, but the audience that you want to get in front of, your advertising revenue from that should be worth more per person or per thousand views than it would be if you're trying to attract everybody. So like if, if I look at the about that, com style example buying a run a network ad on a bot.com for like one dollar cpm 50 cent cpm was probably a thing at the time now if i want to go to the nest or a site like that that's specifically targeting uh parents to be right i'm going to pay a much larger cpm than i did targeting the network for possible parents to be and that, well, Lauren, also um, the, the, the effectiveness goes up, right? I mean, that's like yeah. the other, it's not just price, it's effectiveness. And like when you're putting stuff in front of people who like are actually, you know, have already indicated their interest in it. Cause like, you know, it's like, I, I think John Battelle's like uh, uh, book, the search was like a Bible mm -hmm. for me back when I was figuring this stuff out. It's the database of intentions, right? It's like, it's search is like that that Seinfeld episode where Kramer became um, he accidentally a uh, movie phone got like um, <laughs> forwarded to his phone and people were just putting in the numbers for like when the movie times are everyone is under 40 has no idea what I'm talking about but like yeah, yeah you know no, finally no. Kramer is like why don't you tell me what you want that's search search is, is like why don't you tell me what you want and people just are like tell me it's like it's less complicated than trying to like do all this like you know sorcery <laughs> just tell me tell me your most intimate things in the world tell me and that's Google. like you so, know i think seo in some ways like it's funny because um you know everyone went crazy for um for 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 social and for facebook uh right and and that like and trying to master that algorithm and they sort of left behind like the original algorithm of the internet which was seo but the thing yeah. that like the reason that like you look at how many like big publishers are incredibly successful and are incredibly profitable, whether it's Red Ventures, whether it's um, Dot Dash, you see like Nerd Wallet to me, it's like a form of a publishing company. Um, it is. And on and on and on. The thing that they future, that what they have is they're, they bet on the right algorithm because it's a mature yeah. algorithm. And, and the algorithm has, has gotten to, to the point where there are, are always pockets to game it, but that if you're creating specific uh, con content for specific audiences and you, you have enough of, 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 of a history to have authority, that you're going to do well. And mm -hmm. the people who well, bet on the Facebook algorithm, nobody did well. Nobody did I I change that all the time. Uh, what, was, what was it? Smart articles or whatever? Instant articles? Gone. Um, yeah. AMP? Gone. So uh, point being is that- Is like, AMP officially um, gone yet? It's on its way out. Google's pretty much Good. disowned it. Good. Like it's total, Like I had someone the other day ask me, oh, should we turn on our AMP on Shopify? Google's turned off AMP. Like it's 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 being sunset. It's almost there. It's I, almost lo I, lo I love the, ter on, uh, I love the terms Powell. in this industry, sunsetted. Yes. I prefer, I prefer taken out back and had a bullet put in its head, but <laughs> behind the shed. <laughs> so you were talking about nerd wallet, penny hoarder, and well, we've talked about nerd wallet, yeah. penny hoarder, health line. I, I don't know if, if yeah. everyone understands the health line is owned by Red Ventures, a huge lead generation company. Health line, what's the banking one that they bank rate? They also bank own rate, a huge massive lead, lead gen, yeah, uh, affiliate marketing. So lots of different. All of these pretty much, Nerd Wallet, Penny Hoarder, Healthline, are all very lead generation oriented entities. Then you have Dot Dash, which is, which is more of an advertising oriented entity. Um, the one form of, uh, the one form of uh, monetization and business models we haven't talked about yet is e-commerce. So yeah. there have been some brands that are going out there and they're, and they're either starting 
to publish more, especially because the investment in publishing now is going to pay off a lot more down the road than uh, the short-term investment return in advertising. And uh, they're either starting blogs and publications from scratch or acquiring. So if, if you've been in situations where you've grown something at Digiday, like it's, yeah. it's publishing, it's, it's, it's publishing arm from almost nothing to from a newsletter to being like one of the, one of the most, uh, uh, one of the most successful examples of, uh, yeah, I guess, B2B publishing um, there is out there. So, uh, one question I have for you is that if, 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 if someone's at a Shopify store, like a D2C brand or whatever, and they're suddenly given the task, hey, you need to build out an editorial arm of our company, where should they start? Should they start via acquisition or should they start from zero and then build it up or a hybrid of the two? What would be your recommendations on that front? I mean, I, uh, I don't know. I guess it depends. But like... Um... I would say like, you know, usually it's, it's best to, to start from scratch than acquire. Like, I don't think, um, you know, there's been some examples, um, whether it's like the hustle being, being, um, acquired by HubSpot and there's a few here and there courier. I don't know if you know this magazine, uh, they got bought by, mm -hmm. um, MailChimp. I think they're going to be rather few, fewer and far between. I don't think most, um, most businesses like, don't have the um, stomach to have like a full independent publishing arm. It just doesn't, I, I think that what they need is, is somewhat different. All that right. said, like, I do think that there is a tremendous opportunity to be, you know, a lot of these DTC brands saw, saw opportunities, not just in the, I mean, a lot of them saw opportunities in customer acquisition through Facebook and Instagram ads. And those are more expensive now. And content is a way to lower the cost of customer acquisition. And I think the obvious um, place to start is in what is the, what is the area or problem that you're your brand, because a lot of these DTC brands are themselves extremely niche. Um, right. It, what what is it solving? Substantially, like, you know, and like then it like it it makes more sense. I think the the key is 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 not, and this is where I think a lot of companies probably get um, get caught up is a lot of them sort of work backwards from you know what they want to get out of it like you know the, it's 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 more tactical it's like okay well we got to get better search optimization we got to get down our customer like acquisition and like it's really difficult to build like a publishing brand um you know reverse engineering it from from the end result like mm -hmm. you have to have a point of view and you have to to really break through i mean if, you, if it's just like you know we got to figure out a way to like rank higher on these terms that's one thing but if you truly want to build um credibility in a specific area you 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 need a point of view um and you need a playbook to execute on that versus just you know reverse engineering from whatever kpi uh, is important so thank you for that by the way and something that's some, somewhat similar is uh from a question discussion standpoint is we talked about the new york times a little bit earlier yeah. new york times about.com it got me kind of thinking about uh when um i think about.com adopted WordPress really early and the New York Times did as well um, after that acquisition or part of that, if, if I remember correctly. But then also a there's been a lot of talk recently about the New York Times when they acquired Wirecutter yeah. and brought that into the New York Times family. And then now we see that we're seeing this across the board with publications. Uh, CNN has, it's, it's not CNN plus, it's, it's, another form of C it's another form of CNN. It's all like reviews and information about different themes and stuff like that. Uh, we're seeing we're seeing uh, coupon subdomains on lots of different uh, publications and things. But going back to the whole wire cutter and the transparent user review, and then mm -hmm. click over to buy the item, and they make a sliver of that via affiliate uh, partnership uh, relationships. What are your thoughts on publications yeah. going down that route, which is almost the opposite, yeah. right? New York Times is going to inquiring a business to bring underneath the hood and then everyone starts doing it as well. Is that a positive trend? Where do you see that yeah. going? I mean, it's like, it's like what old, what's old is new again. Like, I guess, mm -hmm. I don't know. I feel like you and I learn we're like in the, what is it? Dazed and confused. We keep get, we keep, <laughs> we keep getting older, but the tactics you know, stay the same age. Like, um, you know, look, SEO was like, you know, the original optimization for the internet. And then like, you know, people, 
you know, went to the, like the newest shiny object and guess what? SEO is still super important and still the basis of like so many internet businesses, whether it's publishers or marketers. Um, same thing yep. with affiliate. Affiliate was like an original monetization engine of the internet. I mean, when did a Amazon start its affiliate program? Um, Some, uh, super early. I saw, yeah. It's always been right. I think what's profound about it is that it's, it can shift, um, a publishing business. Um, Troy Young was a former, um, mm. president at Hearst and he wrote, um, something, uh, this week about where media is going, but I've been, there's a line in there that I, I encouraged him to like dig deeper in. So Troy, if you're listening, you should, which is like moving from CPM to GMV. And I think a lot of times publishers, what's broadly recognized is having a is is content is a great way to establish a connection with a specific group of people and that's what marketers mm -hmm. really want to do and that's why people are like we're going to be a publisher we're going to be a publisher and stuff like this um i think for publishers what's really interesting is getting closer to the transaction um the yeah. closer you are to the money the better you do like there's a, directly there's a the reason that salespeople are the highest paid people at every single company, <laughs> like, because they're the closest to the transaction. Like that's how it works. So if, if I think affiliate is like the gateway to publishers rethinking what they, what they do with their audiences, because it just, when you gather a specific audience, the, the default was, okay, we'll run ads against it and we'll charge a CPM and like, you know, we'll, why, why don't we like direct traffic and take upside? We'll take risk and why, we'll get, we'll get upside uncapped. We're going to drive. Why back. are we taking a small percentage of the sale and we can sell it ourselves? That's Better okay. yet. Why, why would I drop ship when I can sell directly? If I'm food 52 and I'm directing like traffic to you, like, Crusette, like why I should have chosen something easier to pronounce because I don't know French, but why do I do that? Why don't I buy my own like cookware company? And why don't I like sell food 52 branded, um, cookware? Well, there's been so much of that, like in merch, right? Like fast forwarding now with like influencers and things like that. Yeah. There's brand, like the Wolfgang puck. I mean, this is totally irrelevant, but like speaking about the food 52 thing, the Wolfgang puck, uh, like if, if I turn on home shopping network almost any day and around the nine o'clock or 10 o'clock in the morning, it's going to be Wolfgang puck on their sling and Wolfgang puck air fryers, right? Left and right. He doesn't He's got use an in the restaurant. Yeah. But he has an air fryer, right? So point being is that, yeah, you're right. Food 52, something unique. They can bring something to the table, you know, whatever it is, but then also like with influencers, on Insta, YouTube, whatever, with this whole, with this merch thing. I was talking to somebody yesterday, like one of the basketball dads at uh, my kid's basketball practice. <laughs> he had just gone, he, he does t-shirts and he had just gone to um, just like a merch t-shirt conference or whatever, uh, all about that. And he was all hyped about it. I'm like, wow. And he was talking about some YouTube influencers selling, selling. I don't know about profiting, but selling, um, you know, upwards of what, seven figures in merch alone via their YouTube channel. Yeah. I'm like, they sell that much in, in $20 shirts. He's like, no, hundred dollars shirts. Right. So are people willing to pay for scarcity now? Because scarcity is something that has not necessarily been around for 20 years. And suddenly it's back here right? and there. I mean, so like we used to, um, at Digiday, uh, our offices were on Mercer street in Soho for, for, for many years. And, um, it's right in the belly of the beast with like, it's a really weird block between, between Canal and uh, Grand, um, because mm -hmm. you have all of these like sneaker shops like around. So like <laughs> the the hype beasts like were like all lined up, and the, like most of the people lined up, however, were like actually resellers that were gonna like get the sneakers and then resell it and stuff. Mm -hmm. So like the artificial scarcity thing, like the sneaker slash hype crowd. I, I saw it like up close and I remember one day cause it was like normal. There would be like fights that break out. Everyone was smoking pot all the time. And mm -hmm. like the one day though, it was like police were like, you know, setting up barriers and stuff. I'm like, Whoa, this must be a hell of a sneaker drop like at flight club. And then I'm like, no Kylie Jenner's uh, lip kit. And at the time <laughs> I was like, wait, is that like one of the Kardashians is many years ago. Right. And like, right. um, they had police up for like four days to try to keep people back. And I'm like, 
I remember the time I was like, she just posts stuff to Instagram and -hmm. like people are lining up around the block to buy a lip kit that's going to sell out. Like, yeah. And so I think, you know, creators sort of got there first and I think publishers are playing catch up. I think a lot of the models that creators um, are pioneering um, are, are really innovative and that, you know, ultimately publishers are going to end up learning from. I know like when I'm thinking about like what's new, like I'm looking at more like, you know, if you think about like a media company, like Mr. Beast is like Mm -hmm. a a better model for a media company than most of the existing institutional brands. And a hamburger company, by the way, the fact that they have gone, this is goes back to the whole like pandemic accelerating things, right? Like ghost kitchens were not really that much of a thing before the pandemic. And they popped up, everywhere and all the ghost kitchens is like mr beast's burgers yeah taiga's chicken wings and like there's no mr beast burger like that's that's like one little sous chef station in yeah. the book whatever it's called that that italian chain uh buka something uh in my town that's where mr beast burger comes from i'm thinking what I'm like but how intelligent is it at the end of yeah. the day but say, that's, like, not, hey, that's like, actually an interesting point in that like i think one of the hard things with this like pandemic stuff is that Trying to trying to understand what was just a pandemic thing and what's like a, a true shift. It's gonna stick. Right? I think everyone's like one dealing of, with that right now. Like one of the things, like I'm like I'm I'm out on ghost kitchens, but I might like be too <laughs> old for it because like I, one of the few like sort of things that I feel very passionate. Like well, I guess one of my hills to die on is that delivery food sucks. Like oh, I think deli- I think people pizza. are killing themselves. Pizza. It's a very few Chinese food pizza. Like and, and like it's meant. It, it's made for burritos. Technology has not solved this problem. It tastes mm. awful. It just yeah. does not taste good. It doesn't <laughs> taste as good as it does in a warm plate, right? Yeah. Go to a Cold restaurant box. and make your own food. Like yeah. this idea that everyone is going to get like stuff delivered all the time. I'm like, have you guys eaten delivery? Have you oh, eaten right. at a restaurant? Like this stuff oh, never tastes bad. good. French fries, wherever tech has gone next, they've never figured out how to, to make French delivery French fries taste good. I know some people say there's something I've never tasted. No, no, maybe potato logs, but definitely not French fries. <laughs> so um, we're almost out of time. Or we're pretty much, we're over time right oh, now. Shit. That went by really quickly. Um, I do have one more question if you have time. Yeah, of course. So we had alluded to this previously and, and I try to stay away from the old man talk, but you know, oh, what? No. you can't escape it. So you and I, we grew, we were, okay. I, I was thinking about this earlier today when the internet became a thing, it was like 96, right? Pretty much. And, and thank you Jacques yeah. for chiming in here that 1996, I, I think you dropped 1996, not because of the telecommunications act, but because that's when Amazon started their affiliate shop. And I think it still has a UI of a site that was built in 1996. <laughs> Last time I looked, I logged it in my Amazon. So wait, Am- Amazon, Amazon like started affiliate in, in 96? I guess so. That's guess even so. better. Nothing is new. That's nothing the big is, takeaway. Nothing. So um, what was my point? So anyway, the point is in 1996, when the internet was really blowing, was starting to become a thing, I was 22. And I think that's the first time that I actually went on a website. I went to like Jerry's directory or whatever, which became Yahoo after a while. And yeah, that was Amazon, by the way, that dropped in 96. But um, anyway, so I remember what things were like before the internet, right? Because I had about 10, 12 years of consciousness. Like you pretty much remember everything that happened after 10, 11 years old, like during that time. Um, But Anybody under the age of, say, right now, under the age of 37, doesn't really remember a world without the internet, unless they started it later or adopted it later, right? So now with like the whole DeFi movement, the decentralization movement, to me, I mean, you, you, you said it perfectly, like our dream was taken away from us. Right. Yeah. There was this dream, this this wild thing is this information super highway was going to bring us stuff from everywhere. And we're going to excel and we're going to be we're going to build our own sites and build. Our, yeah, I mean, yeah. We've done it. Content. It, I mean, we've content done it. will be free. Advertising will support yeah. it all. We're, yeah, it's going to be great. I mean, we we've done it and we we've we've done well during this uh, change in this this renaissance. But at the same time, what's happened, all the same media companies that owned all the media channels previously. Now they own all the Internet channels. 
So anyone who has grown up with the internet, that's let's say 35 and younger, everything now is either Google or Facebook, right? Google or Facebook. Mm -hmm. That's all it is. Even, even this thing, this Oculus thing, right? Which is supposed to change the world. I haven't opened it yet. Uh, we're using this for our SEJ offsites. It's Facebook. This is a Facebook thing, right? This is a Facebook device in my house. Yeah. So if I grew up with Facebook and Google owning everything, right? That's basically, and maybe being in Microsoft to an extent, that's basically our generation's Ma Bell. Like, do you remember getting going to the store and buying a telephone for the first time and not ordering it from the phone company? Yeah. That was a big deal. That was freedom. We had the freedom to finally go to the store and buy like a cordless phone as opposed to leasing it from Ma Bell. So it feels like to me that, that this whole decentralization thing is, is it's, it's rebellion against the status quo, which is Google, Facebook, Microsoft owning everything, mm -hmm. right? And the same way that the internet to us was against the status quo previously of Ma Bell, uh, maybe Warner or Time Warner, um, and a couple other companies and media companies like GE used to own NBC, like all of that. Like they, it was like a handful of companies owned everything back then. And the internet was the rebellion against that. Now we have the rebellion of DeFi decentralization, everything yeah. rebelling against like a handful of companies owning the internet. Where do you see web three taking the world oh, of publishing? No. I know. Uh, uh, so generally, I think that, like, as I said, like, I do think Web3 slash crypto, like, it, it's really trying to right a lot of the wrongs with with the centralization, both mm -hmm. in finance and, and in our economy, but also um, particularly with Web3 with the platforms, right? Like, very few people are, are happy with the oligo outside of the oligopoly, with the oligopoly, right? I mean, it was like... Think about it like in Washington. Is there any issue that has bipartisan support other than hating Google and Facebook at this point? <laughs> like it's the only thing that can bring our country together. Um, it, but it's very unclear what replaces them. And like I'm very cognizant as like I you know get ever more into my 40s, like towards 50, that, of not being the Grandpa Simpson like shaking his fist <laughs> at a cl cloud. That said. Usually, you know, revolutions come up short and are disappointing, right? Like, I mean, I right. think the history of revolutions is such. And but at the same time, I do think that revolutions push forward um, ideals about like how things can be. And so I don't want to like sort of be negative about like a lot of the Web 3.0 stuff because it's very idealistic because I do think in some ways it's idealistic to the point of being naive. But at the same time, like I think that there's a broad um, belief that the way the internet is working right now and, and society broadly is 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 not good. There's m too many misaligned incentives. Um, and will this solve every single problem? Like I know, like it's like a joke. Like it's like Web three solves this. It's like really, <laughs> like Web three solves everything. Um, I think it, you know, I think it will have like an impact to improve, um, uh, you know, ownership structures and and make the and make the internet almost like, like a less adversarial place to some degree because incentives will be more properly aligned. Yeah, I I can see that. Um, That's a good thing, outcome to me. Like, I don't expect. Yeah. Like, I don't know. Like, I'm not like a utopian person, but at the same time, like, I I, I see. I see a lot of like reflexive dismissal of the web three sort of stuff of, of people like around our age. And I really do think it's just because we've gotten to the age where we're reflexively yeah, we're, dismissal of anything. We're boomers new. now. <laughs> we're any, we anything we're, new. We're, we're like, ah, it sucks. Uh, uh, we graduated. We're not Gen X anymore. Now we're so boomers. So it was before we're internet, internet 1.0. We're like, this is amazing. This is amazing. And then all of a best sudden, we just like, ah, this sucks. Uh, best thing ever. Alta Vista was the best thing ever. <laughs> um, yes, you know I agree. It, it, it's I have like I don't know that much about Web three. I don't know that, that much about NFTs. The other day, like my son asked me, "Hey, Dad, do you have any NFTs?" I'm like, "What do you know about NFTs?" He's like, "Well, you can buy this picture of a tiger for forty yeah. bucks, and it might be worth a million, and then you'll get invited to go on a yacht party." 
Like what? That's what NFTs mean to you, right? Sounds sounds it, broadly accurate, actually. It is kind of accurate. <laughs> and that, that, that's what I think a lot of people think of it as right now. But the more I look into it, I see the, the benefits of smart contracts. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, the ability, talk about like monthly recurring revenue, annual recurring revenue, but the ability to earn royalties off of your published work, whether it's a painting or a pixelization or an article or a book, right? So as that's traded from person to person to person in whatever world it is, it's kind of interesting. It's it's kind of something that we haven't had yet. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you think about art. Level of simplicity. Yeah. You think about artists of all kinds, like, you know, they've been, you know, since the beginning of time, artists have been screwed. So I, I assume that artists will continue to get screwed. Um, but I think that like a lot of the web three uh, mechanics, like with the blockchain and with smart contracts, like can, and, and NFTs can like enable artists to enjoy more of the value than they, <laughs> than they currently have because they're not getting a lot of the value. More of the value. It's also cooler to get screwed over by Jay Z and Jack Dorsey than it is with uh, like uh, traditional record labels, I guess. But that was the one thing. Like when 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 Square acquired Title, right? Yeah. And then Square. And then when I heard Jack Dorsey talk about Square being the solution for the unbanked, right? It's, well, it's and Block then, now. You know, is it Block? They, cha oh, they changed the name. So it's, it's now block. three dimensional. So so yeah. Uh, oh, that's interesting then. So I didn't, I didn't realize that. So that being the financial solution for the unbanked and then, and then the NFT component of title coming in to be able to, anyone can upload a song and then make royalties on people that have, that have traded that and, and sold it or whatever, or listen to it. It's pretty, pretty incredible to me at the end of the day. And again, I don't understand all of this, but it does sound like a little bit of, of justice coming back into the world of whether yeah. it be financial justice or opportunity. So yeah, we're, I mean, we're it's a right, it's a, it, it, to me, it's like a, it's a righteous fight. I know a lot of the like crypto bro crowd. I understand them like sort of rubbing a lot of you're, you're in the center of it, man. I mean, me? not, you're not oh, in Miami. Puerto Rico, but Miami. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Did you go to art Basel? Yeah, I did. How was um, it? Um, it was fine. It was the first time I'd ever, I just went to like a couple things. Like I went to like a dinner and stuff like mm -hmm. this, with like art people and stuff. And it was really interesting to me because um, I don't really understand the art market. So I was like asking these, like how it works. And a lot of the problems are basically the same problems, like in like the like, publishing. publishing industry. It's like, you know, uh, so, you know, it's like, there's still the same issues in, in different, in different areas. Um, but one of the things that became very clear to me is like the creators, a broadly thing is like the creators do not, um, realize as much of the value as they should. Um, there's a ton mm. of gatekeepers taking, taking a piece along the way in the art market, whether you're, you know, a gallery or a curator or a broker. Um, and that's just how it's always been. One of the things that was striking to me is the, the few art, Basel events that I went to, there were not many artists there. Okay, <laughs> because okay. they were. It's like artists are like. Yeah, there's. It's like it yeah, was the money. It was the. Either. It was the money people. It was all the intermediaries. Gotcha. It was like going to a publisher event where it's all ad tech people. <laughs> it's none of the journalists. None of the writers. <laughs> same just, old, same old. Everyone making a buck. <laughs> everyone making a buck. Yeah, hey, exactly. I was like, this work. looks familiar. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So Brian, I've uh, I've dropped the link to your Twitter profile okay. here in the comments, cool. um, as well as your LinkedIn, and then also for anyone that's watching right now, I'm dropping the link to the rebooting. But if you're listening, you can go to the rebooting, the rebooting dot com dot sorry, the rebooting dot substack dot com. Yeah, I have. Do you the have URL. the domain? I, do you I have, have the URL? I, I do. I have. To, I have. To, I have. To, I have to just. I have to set it up. Just Honest. make it redirect. That's, that's all you got to do. Right? I know. I know. Yeah, I know. It's been a pleasure. I really enjoyed connecting with yeah, you. Yeah, Lauren, this is fun. Um, you know, um, just also for all the listeners here, just a reminder that these podcasts are not necessarily an instructional video. This is us having a discussion about the world of content, the world of content marketing the world of publishing, and then how that applies to SEO at the end of the day. Yeah. So the biggest takeaways I would see here from an SEO perspective are really to focus on your niche, focus on what you do, um, the what you do and what you know best. Some of the examples that we've talked about today, um, specifically, sorry, Pete Cashmore, 
But specifically, uh, Mashable and the Huffington Post are examples of companies and publishing companies that tried to be everything to everybody and it didn't work out for them. They tried to be the next CNN. They tried to be the next this, they tried to be the next that. And then suddenly they were just bought and sold on the open market afterwards for much lower than their valuation at the time when they invested in expansion. So if you think about that, not that they're necessarily horror stories, but if you think about that and how this applies to you as an SEO or as an e-commerce company or a site owner, it's focus on your audience, focus on your buyers, take that data that you're getting from Google Analytics that you're looking at from a traffic perspective and try to figure out what your audience is looking for and also ask your audience. One of the most important, one of the most coolest things about email marketing is that it's not like normal publishing is where blogs have taken away comments and things like that. With every email that you send, there's a reply button. Yeah. And one of the easiest calls to action that you can put into an email when you're, when you're blasting that or sending it out to your audience or whatever, is just asking for someone's opinion and giving them the call to action, asking them, please tell me more about yourself. Why did you subscribe to this? What yeah. excites you about next year? What excites you about publishing? And just hit the reply button. I know when someone replies to SEJ emails, I try to, I try to answer them as fast yeah. as I can. Maybe a link's broken. I get the SEJ email. I forward yeah. it to whoever's in charge of that. And then I make sure that I reply to the person letting them know that we, we broke the link. If someone has an opinion, I'll write them back, tell them thank yeah. you or whatever. But it just takes a couple seconds. And you know what? It, 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 it makes people feel like, well, it actually brings your audience in. And it is a two-way street on that side. So, so yeah. in terms of like listeners or viewers, really keep that in mind. Um, this is not a show about, you know, which H1 tags to use, which title tags to use, which schema markup is the schema markup flavor of the month, but it's really about like how to think about the big picture and learn from people like Brian and others that have done this maybe in other fields, right? Like that's not your core competency, Brian, like SEO, right? But no, it's a I don't huge know what important, an H1 tag. Is. Yeah. <laughs> it's a huge, important piece <laughs> of publishing. I know. So if we can learn from I'm Googling it right now from you, right? If we can learn from you <laughs> on uh, how to make our efforts more valuable from a publishing perspective. And one thing I always tell my clients and people I'm working with from the content side is like, this content might be great for SEO, but do not forget nurturing your audience, post sales, follow ups, uh, what you can do, you know, Trader Joe's and Dollar Shave Club, they they send flyers to their customers that have articles about, not about their products, but things, I don't know what you, I mean, I can probably read about shaving all day, but like Trader Joe's, how they're sourcing things, what the big spice is going to be next, next month, et cetera, et cetera. All of that is different forms of content that people are digesting, utilizing different forms. So if you can listen to a show like this and say, Hey, here's everything I learned from Brian's experience at Digiday or Brian's experience launching the rebooting on Substack and apply it to my SEO efforts, that's perfect for you. So okay. there it is, commenters. <laughs> so Brian, thank you so much. Thanks again for joining today. I really appreciate oh. you taking the time. And for our viewers out there, I just want to clarify that stack of books is not standing on its own, is it? No, it's not. It's not. Okay. It's, it's, right. uh, it's got little dividers. Got gotcha. you. Got gotcha. you. <laughs> it's a tower. All right. <laughs> All right. So this has been a really uh, great pleasure. Go I ahead. really appreciate you taking the time to connect today, Brian. We went a little, little bit over time, but I think it was worth it. I got a lot of great uh, ideas. And just for any of the listeners out there, if you have questions, feel free to email us anytime at Search Engine Journal via the contact form or whatever. Hit Brian up on Twitter. Hit me on Twitter. We'll get back to you or we'll try to. So that's it. Anything you want to say before we sign off, Mr. Morrissey? Uh, no, that's it. I uh, hope everyone enjoyed it. Um, check out the rebooting if you have a chance. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much. Have a great weekend. And okay. uh, to everyone out there, see you next week on the SEJ Show. Bye-bye. Cool. Thanks. Thank you for joining us this week on the Search Engine Journal Show. If you liked this episode, subscribe to our channel for so much more and click the notification bell.